time, I will ask everybody to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Dr. Uh, Washington, followed by our invocation. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We pause once again to give you thanks, to give you thanks for our health and wholeness of life, for the blessings you so graciously bestow upon us individually and as the city of Jacksonville. We live in uncertain times, uncertain political times, climate times, the world's tensions, economic, economical times, all of these uncertainties we face individually and we face corporately as the city of Jacksonville. We pray that we would always seek your guidance and that you would give us your protection and your grace as we live in the coming days. As always, we stop to remember those who are on the front lines tonight defending our freedoms, our military men and women. We pray for them and their protection and for their anxious families. Always give guidance and direction to our council and to our mayor. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, Council, you have a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting. Also, we're going to add one, and this is a resolution opposing State Bill, uh, Senate Bill 317. I need a motion to adopt. So for the adoption of the agenda as amended with the addition of the resolution opposing SB 317. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. All right, so that's going to bring us to our first section of public comment for this evening. So um, we're going to, this is a time that the council sets aside during each regular meeting to hear comments from the public. And this is not a question and answer uh, period uh, session. So don't ask the council a question because you're not going to get an answer from, it, from us, okay? That's, that's the rule that council adopted many years ago, so that's kind of where we're going to go. Uh, each speaker who has signed the public comment uh, sheet here will come forward to the podium, and I believe it's the one, one to the right, this one over here, okay? It doesn't have the screen. And uh, when you do come up, I want you to give your name and address to the clerk. Now, you may speak for up to three minutes. There is a shot clock here for three minutes, okay? We're not going to go over three minutes. If you go over three minutes, I'm going to stop you right where you're at, okay? That's, that's going to be it. So you'll need to uh, leave the podium and have a seat at that point. So when it turns yellow, that means you've got 30 seconds, and uh, you might want to wrap your comments up at that time. So, with that said, I'll call the first person who has signed up, uh, Marty Johnson of 137 Zach Circle. Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Thank you so much for this forum so we can uh, speak. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I just moved here recently from Wilmington. Um, I bought a little house over here on Zach Circle. I've only been here six months. Um, and I moved here, I enjoy the area very much. I love the bike paths, the area, the river, all of it very much. So that was one of the reasons I moved here. Um, the problem I'm having is, as I'm walking and riding my bike, is that the speeding is, and I'm sure you're already aware of it, you've lived here longer than I, but uh, it's really bad. Um, my home that I bought uh, is 25 miles an hour, and I bought it there so they would do 25 miles an hour, but they're, they're not. Um, and again, I'm sure this is a problem citywide. As I walk and ride my bike, I see it uh, at an alarming rate, but especially right in front of my house, 
and my home backs up to Shore Drive. So not only do I have Zach, but behind me is Shore, and on Shore Drive, they also do about 40 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. So I'm looking for some sort of ideas on how we might get a handle on it. I know uh, on base, we have flashing signs that tell you what your speed limit is and what it should be. Uh, I know people ignore signs, so that may not be an issue, but I also see speed bumps over here on Roosevelt and a couple of side streets um, that do seem to work. There's three speed bumps with signs, and I realize you can't put speed bumps on every street, but in other words, I'm just looking for some ideas on, on how I might get uh, a handle on that. And I'll keep it brief, but again, uh, I live right out from Marine Boulevard. The speed limit is 45. They don't do 45 because when I'm with them, they're, we're all moving out at about 55, 60 miles an hour. They're not doing 45. And you're building a Starbucks up here on the corner as they come around, they're doing about 60 miles an hour. And, and, and I think that could be a real problem when somebody goes into Starbucks and tries to get out of there. That could be a problem. So again, thank you for this forum. I would like to thank Lieutenant Porter, who yesterday I met and I addressed some of these problems to him. I had some abandoned cars on Zach Circle. He took care of that within an hour. I'm so highly impressed. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. What I'll make sure that gets addressed. Okay. All right. Next, I have Edith Crisp. I think that's right. Uh, Hello. My name is Edith Crisp, and as you have just said. My address is 120 Brevard Court here in Jacksonville. Um, um, I am a concerned citizen. I'm concerned about our citizens that were in town center. I don't know where they disappeared to or where they went. I don't know what, I don't know what kind of assistance that the city provided for them because I was here for the meeting when they were saying, please help us, we have nowhere to go. I know we have a tent city here in Jacksonville, homeless people here in Jacksonville. I also know that Jacksonville has $16 million in un, what is it? Un, un, unrestricted fund balance. Unrestricted funds, $16 million. We want to build a one point some million dollar welcome center. I don't know who we're welcoming when we have people here who need places, affordable places to live. Um, so in my last statement, I just want to say this. <laughs> God makes it clear that government officials are to deliver justice and assistance to the poor. May they judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. And may, the, may they defend the cause of the poor and give deliverance to the children of the needy. That is what your purpose is. That's what your purpose is as you govern this city. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, Scott Haber. Good evening, Council. Scott Haber, 996 New River Drive. Um, I'm here to let Council know that uh, me and my family have found a new place to live. Being at CRG and Kevra here, I'm not putting it out because I do not want them to know where it's at. Also, um, this past week, I've been hearing from some of my tenants that um, Marcy has been going around putting notifications in their mailboxes sneakatively. She's done it to us as well. Um, we already have went to court once with them and we actually won our case. So they went to be sneaky and they went to refile again against us. So now we have until April 7th to be out. As council will know, that is Easter weekend. 
So I'm going to take it as far as the 11th of April, but I will be out before then. Um, basically, you know, as my residents have told me, you know, they're just, you know, want to know what's going on. And they're about tired of the threats that are coming from CRG and Kev and Marcy. Because, you know, she's going around knocking on people's doors or walking in people's houses, telling them, oh, they got to be out the 31st. If they are not out, they're going to take them to court. I don't think that's a way to run a complex. I don't think that's the way you should treat your residents if they quote unquote care, which I've been saying it before and I'll say it again. CIG, Kev, Marcy, none of them care. All they care is about the almighty dollar. They came in here, they knew the military was here, so they want the military dollars. And the only way that they're gonna get the military dollars is to run everybody out of town center. And also to let council know, they are moving people into town center on free, on points that are not the truth. Um, I was told by one of my residents the other day that a person had moved into one of the new apartments and the floor is already buckling and this person hasn't even been in there maybe two weeks, the month, the latest. So in, as I wrap up, what I think the city council needs to do is sit down with CRG, sit down with Kev, and sit down with Marcy and tell them to stop threatening the residents or the residents are going to start reacting back. Because, like I say, council knows this is not the first time and this is sure for not the last time and the residents are having enough of it. They, they, they don't know what to do no more. They, they don't know what to do anymore. No. I don't need anybody so, in the audience to be piping up, okay, unless you want to be escorted out. That, that, that's all I ask from the council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you, council. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, Sharif Foster, I believe I see that right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sharif Foster. Uh, my address is 3324 Frank Gate Drive in Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, good evening. In the brief time that I've worked with CareProp, it hasn't been anything short of an adventure. On September 22nd, 2022, I took responsibility over a property called Boulevard West located in Greenville, North Carolina. I walked into a property that was neglected. On that day, I met so many other residents, whom which were put on the back burner by previous ownership. Many residents and city employees have told us about the crime that once plagued the community. The area was so bad that EMS crews needed police escorts into the property to save, one, save someone in dire need. Pizzerias wouldn't even deliver food after dark because it was so bad. Needless to say, I'm here today to attest to the vision Brad Newton has. Brad's vision is to provide high quality, safe and affordable housing, which from a non-Jacksonville citizen's perspective there is obviously a lack of supply and great demand. In the six months that I've been transforming the community, city workers feel safe coming out to do their jobs. Police patrols the property daily. We even have a village program that serves as transitional housing for domestic abuse survivors and recovering victims of substance abuse. Finally, they are able to bring their children and their ladies out, who are their mothers as well, to come out and play, to just walk around the property and feel safe. And to top it all off, our residents are being cared for by our staff 24 seven. Our units are being remodeled as we speak. And at the end of the day, our residents go to bed at night knowing that they have high quality, safe and affordable housing. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Marcy Blackman. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's Marcy Buckman. Um, so I'm here to talk about, um, on a good note, um, we, last time we spoke, I had 69 re residents and um, now we're at 46. And we, um, so on the plus note, some people were able to find some housing 
and um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I have been working diligently to help give them resources as they got the funds from the shelter and um, Robert Hudson being involved with the HOP program. So he's helped, you know, qualify some people and get them places to live too. So there is some good out of this that people are finding places. Um, and there is more in that list right now that have, that have been finding places. Um, so that's a good note. Um, also, I wanted to talk about the current residents that we do have. Um, they are very happy with where they live. Uh, they have had one maintenance request, and it was a it was a dryer, a brand new dryer that came in just not working. So we replaced it, you know, for free, no charge. But there is nothing wrong with their units. They are perfectly fine in their units. There's nothing wrong with their floors or walls or anything. They've all been inspected by the city anyhow. So. Um, so I just wanted to bring that on a good note that we do have residents that are happy and we have people that are going to be moving into our new ones. We're going to be getting four new ones, uh, certifi certified for occupancy, um, starting probably the end of this week, we should get some COs. Um, I have four people that are ready to go and ready to move in. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, we are bringing the housing and there is a demand for it. Um, so we do have people coming um, to move in soon uh, and that are really looking forward to, you know, to the new town center. Uh, we're really looking forward to moving this project forward and providing how much needed housing for the community of Jacksonville. So which will, you know, also bring more you know, revenue to Jacksonville with having all these people come here. Um, plus there is a need for housing with the um, base closing in Texas, so there will be um, more housing for people. Um, also, the some of the residents that live there are not all military. They are, you know, I have a single mother that lives there and she's perfectly happy, um, you know, paying the rent that we ask. And so, and then there's another, there's another family there that, um, is coming from Guatemala. So it's not all military. It's just people that are qualified that have, you know, no evictions and no, you know, felonies. We're just trying to make it a good community. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know that on a positive note, it is, it is going well, and we plan to keep moving forward Thank in you, a Ms. positive Parker. way. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Steve Souther. Stephen Souther, 900 Barcelona Court. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Carter, Mr. Ray. It's a pleasure to see all of you up here tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to come up here and talk to you. Um, I prepared a packet uh, last time I was here for you guys to look at. Unfortunately, we weren't able to discuss it. Um, it does appear that you guys have looked at it and reviewed it, and I appreciate that because it seems like we've been talking for 10 months and we are starting to make some headway now between CIG and the city of Jacksonville. And um, it feels really good to know that what we're talking about with you is not falling on deaf ears because our agenda is to take and renovate 694 apartments in New Town Center, which could create almost 3,200 people living in Jacksonville Town Center. We're very excited about that. As we come here each time and visit the property, we see the, the changes that are being made there. We see the residents that are moving in. We see the apartments and the conditions that the new, new apartments look like. And it's a completely renovation for the, for the city. And we're excited about that. And we hope you're excited about that too. Um, one of the things that we talked about last time um, that we weren't able to discuss that Mr. Carter brought up at the end was the bonds and covenants that we had to stand by to work on the water bill, to work on a credit. I put together an equation. I spent a lot of time going back over months and months of bills and gave you several examples on why I feel like we were owed a credit for the money that we were paying for unused water. We don't have a problem paying for one drop of water that we use. It was the thousands and thousands of gallons of water that we were paying for that we weren't using. So I put together a, a packet last time that I had passed out to all of y'all that I'm sure you've had time to look at and discuss after your um, meeting last time in closed doors. 
Um, one thing that we, you know, we have talked about in closed door discussions were satisfying the bonds and covenants. And Mr. Carter referred to a book last time that said that due to that book, that that's what you had to stand by. And that only Senate Council can vote against the bonds and covenants to agree to any type of deviation from what was in that book. One that was discussed was capping off um, the meters or the piping for each individual unit, which everybody knows once you disturb any type of piping, um, you cause problems down the road. But that would be to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars to cap off every individual apartment in there. So at the back of my packet, I came up with a very inexpensive solution on how we can go through and cap off each one of those um, apartments that aren't being used to satisfy your bonds and covenants. Um, when I submitted that to Mr. Ray, I was responded with, we still need a map. Well, thank you, Mr. Ray. I do appreciate you finding the map for us in the engineering department where that map should have been found. So that does help us to figure out the spider web, a reverse engineer, um, where each meter goes to. And like I said, some of them are as high as 55. We only had two residents tied to those 55, but we were paying for the other 53 units that were not using any water at all. But I just want to thank all of you um, and appreciate you listening to us and, and what you've been saying behind closed doors to help us get our um, agenda accomplished. Have a great day. Thank you. Brad Newton. Again, kind of hold your comments down when somebody else is speaking. Let's... Ready? <laughs> Mayor and Council, thank you all for having us tonight. Picked another wonderful day for uh, us to come to Jacksonville, beautiful sunny day. And um, I was able to tour some of the new units that um, went through the whole CO multiple inspection process and some new resident moved in that were uh, all kinds of different diverse and things like that. So first wanted to thank you for um, you know accomplishing that big goal of the new people moving in and how excited they are and how they've been you know really Desperate, one of them lived at Town Center before and now um, was able to move back in and left us some wonderful reviews about that. So thank you for that. And thank you for, you know, the different team members, Carter and, and Ray, Mr. Ray, uh, working with our team and continue to work in behind the scenes and accomplishing all that we can. I just toured over there where they're doing a bunch of the units and it looks like we're about to have a bunch more done soon, this week even. And uh, as many as 10 more people moved in by the end of the month. So we're really seeing the, the subtraction that we had hoped for and we look to, you know, going through the next month and really scaling that and working together and doing that. And, and thankfully, um, Parnell was here. He's our head of maintenance and maintenance director. He has said there's only been the one repair that they had mentioned about a, a washer and dryer brand new one that wasn't working. So residents have been very, very happy and uh, thankful to, to be in there. So I just look forward to being able to work with you. Uh, you know, we had a lot of discussions last time, I guess you would say, or a lot of speakers last time, not a lot of discussions, but I want to make sure you all know that I'm willing to come here at any time to meet with all of you on whatever grounds or common grounds that you would like and uh, go over any questions that you have and any additional uh, thoughts that you have or ways we can make sure we continue to work together to provide the housing that you guys desire. But most importantly, you know, the investment is here for the community. It's the right thing for the community. It's a hard thing to be done. I think that's why multiple people have failed. And I hope nobody in, in this room has a hope and, and, and a dream for CIG to fail at uh, the, the transformation of town center. You know, it is a over $40 million investment in the town. And based on the county <clears throat> records and things I've chosen, I don't think there's been many to that level, all private, no public funds, no public funding, no additional ask for this, please give us this for free, any of that. We've been here to embrace the town. We've used local contractors and really been able to pour into the community. And uh, I just want to be a part of that with you together and, and give the glory to God ultimately for all that he's done. Mr. Carter, I know a lot of things about you. Have we had time to work together? But uh, I feel like I can pray pretty good, but uh, it's always fun to look forward to your opening uh, prayers and doing that. So uh, if there's anything I can do, uh, I can give any, uh, any of you my cell phone or my card. I'd be glad to come at any time when any of your time permits to continue to work together. Just uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I want you to know our tagline is investing with a purpose, and we will continue to do the things that, as she read in that Bible verse, that gives God the glory. We treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Have a blessed day. Thank you.
All right, so next we have the adoption of the minutes and consent items. We have like four consent items and minutes from March 7th, uh, 2023 workshop meeting. Move approval of the minutes and consent items. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Next, we have item number five. This is designation of a voting delegate for the 2023 uh, National uh, NCLM uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities City Vision. And I think that uh, Councilman Jackson and Council Member uh, Cindy Edwards are attending, uh, are the only people from Council attending. So we need one voting delegate and one alternate delegate. So I would entertain nominations at this point. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate Brian Jackson to be the voting delegate and I'll be the alternate. Second. Any other nominations? Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move the nominations be closed and uh, the motion carried by acclamation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Next, we have the JTDA, or uh, Jacksonville yeah. Tourism. You, I'm we need sorry. an alternate yeah. delegate. Oh, you said the alternate. Yeah. I, I did them in one motion, yes, sir. It was all in one motion. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you want to uh, let the, uh, the the public go if they, they don't want to listen to the discussion? Not not trying to tell you your business now. <laughs> hey, right. I, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hey, so look, it, it, once you get started and wound up, they're yeah. stuck here for a hey, while. Hey, look, I, I got I got to be here. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll take a we'll take a very short little. I mean, I'm talking about 30 seconds. Uh, if you want to leave, now's a good time because you probably probably won't get a whole lot out of what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Save, save him from anything. Not that Anthony doesn't give good uh, information. That's not exactly what I meant. He just gives long information. Does anybody need some water while I'm up? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Go by and see your cabinets. Your cabinets. Okay, so somebody nominate Mr. Edwards for the alternate delegate, please. I'll do that. All right, so we had a little faux pas there as far as our nomination. So we have a nomination. Is there a second? Second. For the alternate? You don't need a second. Okay, we don't need a second. Okay, any other nominees for alternate? Will the nominations be closed and the candidate elected by acclamation? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? All right, so I'm going to I'm going to push I'm going to push number uh, add in front of the uh, Anthony's here. This is a resolution opposing State Bill 317. I'm going to let uh, well, uh, I'm not going to let him, but uh, Mr. Ray is going to give you some background on this. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity and for letting me speak before Anthony. I do appreciate that so much. Um, you received a handout that uh, city clerk put in front of you tonight. That handout has three things. The first thing it has is the staff summary giving you a little bit of history. The second thing it has is Senate Bill 317, which is currently in the Senate at the North Carolina General Assembly. And then the third thing is a resolution that we've crafted that is in opposition of that Senate bill. So one of the challenges that you're going to see with this, uh, with this Senate bill is the headline is fantastic. It, it is entitled an act to establish workforce housing developments to address critical housing shortages for firefighters law enforcement officers teachers nurses first responders and other vital workers and first-time home buyers on its title alone it is incredible and so uh, mr massey and i've had a conversation with the north carolina municipalities and with the metro mayor's group that if that were the case everybody would, would support it because we know we have this shortage just as many people have said to you tonight and previously the challenge is 
the way that the legislation is written creates issues for local governments throughout the state. So one of the challenges that it does is it says that uh, local governments will extend our water and wastewater services within three miles of our city limits. So if you think about it, those are one of those things that we utilize as our opportunity for annexation. Uh, the second thing it does is it limits our ability to enforce our building codes and our zoning ordinance on these properties because again, it's outside. So what we say in the resolution and what we've shared with our counterparts across the state is when you protect the zoning ordinance and our development standards, you're protecting the overall property within our city and you're protecting our citizens. A lot of people move into cities so that their property is protected. The concept of not in my backyard, it doesn't matter in counties. In counties, you build whatever you want to next to someone's property. So this is a big issue for us. So on the outset, we look at it as uh, there are challenges that this bill will create with the way that we operate local government. And so we're asking for council to consider that, to discuss that with us here tonight. And I apologize we didn't get this out to you sooner. We received this last week, uh, towards the end of the week, from our represent representatives asking questions, as we do on multiple things, of how will this impact our ability to serve the citizens. So we have that presentation to you, and we have presented you with an option uh, to oppose not only SB 317, but other legislation that would take away our abilities to enforce our uh, our ordinances, our building code, and to protect the integrity of our water and wastewater systems. Questions? Well, I think the whole thing here is, is this would inhibit growth for our city. It would be very inhibiting. I mean, already with the annexation laws as they are, you know, there's no involuntary annexation in North Carolina now. It's all, you know, that's our only way of growth is through that voluntary annexation by providing water and sewer. But, uh, and Mayor, we were at that, at that ribbon cutting basically mm -hmm. last week right. where we had the opportunity to look at a development that gave us 80 new units, brand new quality housing, awesome opportunity. And you look at that, that area was designated by council I think in 2009 as a growth area. That's effective planning. That's why we have planners look at where we can extend our utilities, where we can handle traffic flow, where we can have like-minded services that provide for the people that are going to live there. And, and another part of that is we always look at traffic impact. There are certain areas in our city where it may blow your mind, but the traffic backs up multiple times throughout the day. And our challenge is to manage traffic flow. So in all of these developments, we work through the North Carolina Department of Transportation and we make sure there's some type of traffic impact analysis. In our head, it seems like that's a cumbersome process for people to look at, but if developments do not look at how the impact of traffic will, impact, will affect that whole area, then we have to do that. And so these are one of those requirements that are vital for our success inside of Minnesota Limits because we see traffic flow early mornings, mid-afternoon and, and later in the afternoon that impact how we move from A to B. So those are all standards, Mayor, that, uh, that's part of our normal process. But through this legislation, uh, it'll create some challenges for us on that enforcement. It, yes, would, al it would also create, um, you know, if you look at the actual proposed statute, you know, Section F, it discuss the three-mile option. It says, nor may a local government deny application. So you have no option unless it's greater than a three mile. However, while, while it is desirable to have workforce housing, I think we all agree, low income, affordable, and workforce housing are all needs that our community, you know, we, we want to see that happen here. Having it happen in this manner, uh, where every single time this kind of thing is proposed, we are forced to provide water and sewer. That, we're, we're looking, we recently just had a discussion about our utility operating in a truly, you know, self-funding manner. Uh, the cost of providing water and sewer three miles here and three miles there and three miles here and three miles over yonder is going to create all of our citizens having to face a water bill that they're not going to love due to the expense of that requirement. And, and our hands would be absolutely tied regardless of the expense or the number of applications received. It's not a bad thing to have this housing. It's just there are some loopholes and issues that need to be resolved before it moves forward, I believe, as well. 
Mayor, that's what we're asking. With this, with this resolution, what staff would like to do, if council considers that tonight and votes to oppose and to adopt this resolution, we want to send this back not only to Senator Zara, Representatives Cleveland and Shepard, we want to share that with the league and with our Metro Mayor's team Absolutely. so that they can share it. Because what we already heard, Ron and I last Friday, multiple people have concerns, but they're looking at how do you effectively respond to the North Carolina General Assembly? Because this, the General Assembly is trying to solve another pandemic. It's a huge issue, and we know that very clearly. So they're trying to figure out how to uh, empower some of the developers to make things happen. And we want to be a part of that discussion, which is where this, this kind of surprised us in the, in the, uh, in the bill, bills that were introduced. We weren't ready for this one. None, none of the parties saw this coming out, even though we knew this was a bigger discussion. And so we want to try and utilize this as a tool to engage in that conversation. I'm pretty confident that Senate Bill 317 is going to move through the Senate with some iteration of what they're trying to accomplish. Our goal is to be at the table with them to try and develop a, a bill that can be effective and that we can all utilize in that process. Mr. Ray, I have a question. Has there been any conversations with the water authorities across the state of North Carolina in terms of how to provide these wastewaters and water utilities in conjunctions with the city to take some of those financial burdens off the cities? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Washington, one of the things that we did when we sat down with our le legislation or our legislative team was to mention our efforts with our own water association, with that authority. So one of the things that the state has been trying to do through the league is bring together multiple authorities to add comment to the discussion. We feel that the water authorities, water and wastewater authorities, are an excellent avenue to encourage this type of development, but it's a little difficult because of the mandating of the connectivity to those systems. It seems easier since the cities and counties are creatures of the state to say that we need to serve those areas. Our relationship with Onwasa allows us to look at different areas. If we can't serve it, we just simply go to Onwasa and say, is this an area that you can serve? And so if a development comes to us, we have that active dialogue now, not just because we have members on the council that, that sit on Onwasa's board, but because our staffs work so well together. So I think that's an, an excellent opportunity for us to serve the developments without requiring cities to mandatorily connect the systems. Mm -hmm. Well, a good example of that is the trash property that we've been working working on with on Wasa to, to to get that served. Uh, but this this bill this bill right here would be, I, I, in my opinion, would be uh, harmful to us as far as being able to to grow our city. And like I say, the only only two options we have for growth right now that's available to us is is either, you know. Voluntary annexations, fill, infill, it, or raise taxes. And I don't like that option either. So, this, uh, this bill as written is is full of inequities, and um, it it's I think sets a da dangerous precedent. Uh, even though the aim may be good, I suspect that neither that probably none of those three have any municipal or county level experience and I think I think it shows uh, the way it's written that uh, they don't understand local workings and they're trying to I think they they've come in come at this thing with some preconceived notion that uh, municipalities and regulations are all bad and they're trying to run roughshod over it in my opinion just just what just from the tone of what I what I read to, you know briefly so and, and Mayor, that's what we're seeing. That's why Senator Lazara has such a, an excellent opportunity here with his fellow senators to explain his experience at this level and to hopefully speak for our municipal utility systems and our municipal operations. Hopefully that'll be some value. And that's why when, when Senator Lazara had contacted the mayor to talk about this and then we had this dialogue, we wanted to bring it to council so at least gives him and that team some information to have a, an honest dialogue about the impacts it will have. I think that it's a very negative impact on the existing city citizens from the water and sewer standpoint. I think they're going to be asked to shoulder 
um, an unfair and inequitable amount of uh, expense to provide for this. And I, I just don't think that's, that's right and fair or just. I totally agree. Those system fees, Mayor, if you come into, it's not, a, it's not an impact fee, but a system fee system that. that would be added. If you lose that opportunity to utilize system fees for these extensions, then what happens is everybody pays for that. So like right now, when Wally and his team are working through our, our fee schedule module, if you don't have those dollars that you factor in for the capital, it can impact all of our rates. So it'll, it'll be a monthly impact. And so that's some of those indirect challenges that when you write a bill of this nature, you may miss out a little bit, especially as Dr. Washington points out, we have an excellent partner with Onwasa that, that we can tap into that wouldn't necessarily have that type of impact on us. It would still impact our ability to, to enforce our zoning, to enforce some of our, our building code, because we operate a little differently than the county. But when we have that opportunity, it's our belief we should be able to maximize that relationship and the utility there to make it happen. Well, if this is if this bill is written in good faith, then there was there there would be a lot of un, unintended consequences. I think you know if it did pass in its current state. Mr. Ray, I have another <clears throat> question, just out of curiosity, and I don't know if this particular bill were would pertain to this, but we have quite a few municipalities that are located adjacent to military installations. So if this particular bill were to pass, how would that affect those military installations in terms of um, connecting to those water mains and those wastewaters if, if these new developments were happening? where those military installations were very close in that ETJ of that area that possibly that we're talking about as well. Yeah, Dr. Washington, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. My assumption is if, if the installation, if it's on base, then most of those areas are gonna be served by the on base systems, but I don't know specifically. I would have to ask that question to see. Um, if they're on our system, then it would impact us because we would still be forced to extend our services if they make that request. I was just thinking because sometimes um, municipalities may decide to sell some land to um, military installations as part of that intergovernmental um, agreement. And with that being, a government installation can easily build new affordable housing for those active duty service members and their families. So I was I was just thinking about that as well. Great point. Mr. Massey would probably have a better understanding of that process. I, I can't imagine, and I could be wrong, that the the writers of the legislation have thought that deeply into the into the impact. I hope they have, because we want them to understand what it does. But um, at its first read, I'm in the same place. So that's a good point. We'll figure it out and and put that question over to our team. Thank you. All right, so council, you've been asked to approve this resolution opposing Senate Bill 317. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second, maybe. Anybody want a second? Second. Any other discussion? Uh, a, little, a little bit of a suggestion, I guess, is that the resolution as printed is directionless. It just goes to the General Assembly. I think what we need there is a now for, be further resolved that a copy of this legis resolution be directed to members of the Onslow County delegation and a copy to the League of Municipalities asking for their support of the intent of the resolution. That sounds like a good idea. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so we'll just add that on. Mayor, uh, that's called wisdom right there, and I apologize that we didn't get that in, and we were smarter, but that's why we have Mr. Bittner. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why we keep him around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For some reason. <laughs> so make sure that's added. let's make sure that's added to it before we sign and seal it and send it off. So, okay. So all those in favor? Uh, Hi. Uh, opposed? Okay. So that motion carries. Now, we're going to hear about the Jacksonville Tourism Development Authority update from Mr. Anthony Prince. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we're going to finish up the presentations tonight on a positive note. 
And so a lot of times I get to stand up here and bore you with a lot of FTA and DOT stuff, but this is just simply fun and positive for our community. So what I wanted to do is just go over a quick overview for our new council members and some of the folks at home who may not know what the TDA is, and then we'll talk about the fun stuff. So we've got a couple of, uh, um, we've got a, a session law as well as a general statute and a council resolution that were enacted to create the TDA. Started in 2009, bled over into 2010, and we started operating the TDA in fiscal year 2011. The intent here is simply to promote travel and tourism. That's the long and the short of it. And there are some other rules that, that kind of govern how we do that, but that is the overarching purpose. We have a six member board of directors who are appointed by the city council. And the chairman of that board of directors is also appointed by the city council. Uh, by state law, Sabrina, our finance officer for the city is also the finance officer for the TDA and she thoroughly enjoys that role. <laughs> uh, and then by resolution, the city manager is a designated staff to the TDA, and of course that has been delegated to me, and uh, I'm part of my team in transportation services as well as some others throughout the city. But at this point, we do not have any full-time employees. We are all part-time participants and contributors. And I'll look to Mr. Warden to correct me if I say anything out of bounds here. So funding wise, the occupancy tax is what funds the TDA. It's 3% of the gross receipts from each um, hotel as well as short term rental uh, opportunity here in town. We are able to pull some amount of that uh, back for, for uh, excuse me, to cover our administrative expenses for actually administrating the tax itself. It's usually around 40,000. But then the residual is divided up one third for promotion, two thirds for tourism related. Now, traditionally, that is not the formula. We were able to have our formula switched in 2009, I believe it was, um, or it was in 2009. It's like 13 or something, 15. Yeah. Anyways, the, the point is, is that Senator Brown was able to do the flip for us so that we now have tourism related at two thirds promotion at one third. The good news about that is, is that we're able to bank some of that tourism related money to help support some of our future capital improvements that we're looking to work on. Shows you what the occupancy tax has done since fiscal 11 and you can see it's gone through its ups and downs as low as 841,000 and then as high as 1.5 million. Now that spike there looks a little counterproduct uh, counterintuitive, but uh, that was the aftermath of Hurricane Florence. So we had a lot of folks in temporary housing uh, in hotels. And then you can see the effects of COVID, it dropped straight down and now we're starting to somewhat regulate uh, as we progress away from COVID. Uh, the estimate for fiscal 23 is 1.174 million and we expect slightly higher for fiscal year 24. So looking at the budget for 23, these are the revenue sources. Uh, one thing to point out here is that investment earnings current year are around two, $3,000 and change. Uh, but because of the work that Sabrina and her team have done, we're anticipating that the investment earnings for 24 are going to be around 109,000. So making our money work for us allows us to reinvest in tourism development. We also appropriate some fund balance every year, just like the city does. Uh, that fund balance is appropriated for the promotion side of the house. So when we do our marketing and things of that nature. Total 1.23. And then on the expenditure side, you can see that administrative uh, cost that's pulled off the top and basically transferred straight to the general fund. And then the tourism promotion and um, investment earnings is incorrect. What that should say is tourism related. So 481,000 for tourism promotion and then tourism related at 711. So by the end of this fiscal year, there's no way that we're gonna expend that tourism related budget and we fully anticipate transferring probably more than half a million of that into our capital fund balance once the year is done. Some of the activities that we work on, marketing, events, 
All this is to support tourism opportunities in our community. We're gonna go through a few of these. So let's talk about marketing. Uh, this is a bit of a, uh, um, a preview of what the city's new web page is going to look like. So we work with uh, Civic Plus just like the city does on our tourism web page. And uh, over the past six months, Lisa and her team have done an excellent job in, in revitalizing our web presence because over five, six, seven, eight years, it starts to, to age and we want to keep it modern and hip and appealing because what we're trying to do is to get people to come here and visit our community. So if you have an opportunity, please look at visitjacksonvillenc.com. There's been a lot of great work there and there are also a lot of great resources. We're marketing the International Food Trail and if you're not familiar with that, please take a look because we've got an amazing culinary presence here in Jacksonville. Uh, the lady that you see here on the screen is from the Filipino, Filipino Cuisine Restaurant. And these are just the best people that you'll ever meet. And they run awesome businesses and serve excellent food. We also, it, it's hard for me to believe that people actually get paid to travel and eat. But, you know, they, they do. And so that's part of our marketing uh, uh, part of our promotions for the TDA and part of our marketing pitch is to bring people who have a lot of followers to our community, show them the great things that we have to offer, and then they write nice stuff about us, and 7 million people get to see it. We also host bloggers. You know, those folks don't spend as much time here, but we have the same reach. Our waffle lady, I think we've talked about her before, Miss Regina at the Hampton Inn. She's garnered a lot of attention this year, and most of that has to do with us promoting her as a key you know, attraction. She's a wonderful lady, and she's very creative and just an excellent ambassador for the city, so much so that she was awarded a very prestigious uh, award this year by the North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. So you can see her on the left-hand side next to the pineapple there, but what you can't see on the very bottom are all the legislators that she got to rub elbows with when she was at the, the, the awards ceremony. So again, a great award for a great lady. Southern Living Magazine, yes, it's still around, and we were in the digital version. We were also in the print version, but Everybody takes their news digitally these days, so that's what we try to focus on. I'm not an expert, but Cardinal and, the, and, and Pine seems to be a pretty important travel type of publication as well. But this one I think is, well, I mean, it's, it really touches me, and I think it's very important for our community and our heritage. So our marketing professionals that, that we employ uh, Susan Dozier and Teresa Beecham, they've really taken this on as one of their key projects, and they want to spread the word about our Montford Pointers. And they were able to, to tag team with someone who has contacts at ABC News, and they completed a documentary that's actually online right now. It's a 30-minute documentary, and uh, we can send you the link to it, but it, it's just, it's, it's a great story that they tell about the Montford Pointers and what they meant to the Marine Corps and, and also to our community. There's also some local celebrities in there that we all know very well, so uh, please take a look at that. But this National Geographic exposure, I mean, that's really top-notch big league stuff. And then award-winning, too. Um, just like Regina Viamark, who's uh, Teresa Beecham, she's one of our contractors, they won an award this year for digital, digital marketing. And basically what this is, is their ability to take a short amount of time and a small budget to create large exposure for our Onslow Veterans Pow Wow. This was the first year that it occurred, is what the award is for, and of course we've been supporting it ever since. So let's talk about events now. Veterans Tribute is a great time, and uh, we've got some excellent participants here on the screen. Of course, the young man in the, the Navy uniform probably wishes that he was his brother in the Marine Corps uniform right there, but uh, we also see Colonel Massey there on our 
on our on our walk within the uh, Memorial Gardens. I'll let him tell you the story of that picture. It's a, it's a really good one. But we also had a laser light show, which was very well attended. It's something that we want to continue doing to support our veterans and just show that, you know, the community cares. It's part of us and, and we certainly appreciate that. The Pacific Arts Fest is something that we've started to promote as well. It used to be outside of the city and because of our support of them and their desire to grow, they were able to move it into the city. And they have all kinds of great activities. They have food, etc. It's just a wonderful event. A key theme that you're going to continue to see here, whether it starts with the trail or whether it starts with the Pacific Arts Festival here, is just the culture that we're demonstrating and that we're promoting for our community. It's one of the greatest assets that we have. And, and you'll see here uh, at the end, once we talk about future events, it's something that we're going to continue to pursue as well, going to continue to promote. The Pow Wow is just an amazing event. And if you haven't been, please go. The Ali Temple um, events, these folks know how to have a great time. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, and they're dressed to the nines. We support them. They bring a lot of people from out of town. Then we have our run, our um, running events, whether it's uh, sponsored by the Sports Commission or whether it's an uh, MCCS <laughs> event. Those bring tons and tons of people to town. It's amazing to see the metrics on that. Of course, sports with basketball, uh, the New River Splash, which is a triathlon. We've got some good news about that coming up here in a minute. Uh, Ainsley's Angels, also part of that event, as well as another race event that we helped to sponsor. And then a new one that we recently brought to town from Fayetteville is Carolina Gloves. And that was just an amazing opportunity for us. It showed up on our door. We had a short time to execute. We did, and we brought them here to Jacksonville, and they're going to continue to hold their event here as long as we'll have them. So special thanks to uh, Susan and her crew at, the, uh, at Jacksonville Commons for accommodating us. It was challenging, but they were able to rearrange and make sure that, that we were able to have the event. Fishing, what we're finding is it doesn't really bring people to town, but it was pretty neat to try. I'm not sure where that's going in the future, but what does bring people to town is fashion. This is the FTM Fashion Week. Uh, Vivica Fox on the left. I'm not 100% familiar with her, but evidently she's a big name and she had a big old time while she was here in Jacksonville. The Bridal Expo. The thought here is that we're not necessarily bringing a whole, pe a whole lot of people here for the expo itself, but it's an investment in future. Uh, we're making an investment here in future returns. So people have their expo here, learn about having their, uh, their wedding in Onslow County in Jacksonville, and then what they do is bring all their family with them when they have the actual event. So it's not an immediate return. It's more of a long-term investment. Maybe that's a way to say it. Jazz in the city, those guys have fun too, that's for sure. But let me show you the reason why we do this. It's not just because they're fun, okay? They are fun, and for folks who say there's nothing to do in Jacksonville, I think we just kind of proved that wrong, okay? There's plenty to do here, you just gotta look around a little bit. But when you look at the metrics, that one event for Carolina Gloves didn't cost the city really anything at all. The, the TDA put in a couple thousand dollars to help with security. We offered the gymnasium, but you see the economic impact there, $255,000 for one event, 182 boxers. Some of those came from different countries. Most of them came from different states, traveled a long way. So, that's real tourism economic development right there. And those are the things that we're trying to accomplish. And hopefully over time, these are the metrics that we're going to be able to report to you. We did this and it did this. And we continued to invest and it did this. So, and, and again, the sports commission who put this on, they're just amazing partners for us. We do support nonprofits. I mentioned the Sports Commission before, Sturgeon City, as well as uh, Carolina Museum of the Marine. You can see what we have allocated to them. 
um, in fiscal 23. Uh, most of what you see there is for promotion type activities, not necessarily operations, uh, but there is some of that. And what we're trying to do is to, to push more of that nonprofit support to the promotion side so that we can reserve our tourism related dollars for other investments. We did make one capital improvement this year. It's the Lejeune Memorial Garden sign, believe it or not. And this may sound like a lot of money, but in construction, it's not. We built that for $30,000. And it was quite the feat to get it done. And it's just a great addition to the Lejeune Memorial Gardens because it never had a monument type sign to say, hey, you're here. So this is one way that we contribute to the, the military heritage as well as tourism. So looking forward with the year ahead, we're gonna to continue to ramp up on social media. We do a great job right now, but the fact is that's where people get their news. That's where people make their decisions. And so if we're not connecting to them with tourism via social media, then we're not connecting with them. There will be a phase two of the food trail and I'm super excited about that. Uh, we will be revamping the visitor guide because even though social media and, and, and digital is taking over, um, you'd be surprised how many people want a printed visitor's guide still. And we, of course, we put those at all of the um, welcome centers um, throughout the, the state as well. Um, we are gonna continue to host travel riders, but as I mentioned before to you about performance metrics, we wanna look more at research data and become informed, well, informed to a greater extent, on what is going on within our market and what we can do to make it better, you know, to capture a lot more of that tourism, you know, I hate this word, but we use leakage a lot. You know, there is a lot of that going on. So how can we retain as much as we can? And then of course, how can we draw resources from and people from other places to come and, and stay in our community? Again, back to our cultural events, the Filipino uh, Fiesta. That's gonna be a great party and it's gonna be at Onslow Pines, but we're hoping to get them to come to the city next year. Hot Summer Nights Fashion Show. Um, Reverend Warriors, I'm not 100% on that, but what I understand is that uh, it's a wounded warrior type of, of event that brings a lot of people from out of town to participate. And then a stand battle. Um, my understanding is, is that's a dance competition, but you know, it's over my head. Mm -hmm. uh, new, so, so some really good news with the, tri with the triathlon is that we were able to invest a little bit more money with the sports commission this year, and they are now USA triathlon certified, which opens them up to a bigger market. We'll draw in people from a variety of different areas more so than it ever has in the past because it'll be part of their competition circuit, which is great. Um, Hispanic Heritage Festival as well. It's an event that we're working on with Ola, a local nonprofit. And believe it or not, just like people get paid to travel and eat food, people also um, take their, their recreation and get paid for esports. It's a growing trend. Playing Nintendo is something that you know, schools, you know, universities, they're all picking this up. I feel, I think I heard at one point that it might become an Olympic sport. You know, so this is just us evolving with the times. We have a young demographic, you know, we have a young demographic that comes to visit too. So this is just giving them something that's within their kind of purview to draw them in and to maybe stay a little bit longer. We're also looking to, to uh, reinitiate our military reunion program. And the question might be, well, why? Well, the answer is, this, it's a big business. And when we look at other communities, you know, they're fully taking advantage of it. This, the opportunity to host reunions like this is very unique to military communities. And we certainly want to take advantage of it as much as we can. Um, we did have a partnership with the chamber a number of years ago, and, and we ramped up to the point where we were hosting multiple reunions per month. And then COVID hit, all that kind of fell apart. And now we're figuring out how to 
figuring out how to get it back up off the ground. So you look at the economic impact there, and given the scale of this reunion, it's, it's fairly small considering what we've been hearing lately. So they range anywhere from, say, 50 people to 400, okay? And if you're looking at a $68,000 impact for one small event, Think about what the impact would be for much larger events. Uh, we will be asking the, the TDA to allow us to allocate additional resources to this program and to hopefully hire a full-time person in order to manage it. Uh, that's what we had before when we were working with the chamber on the program and it worked out very well. Uh, and I think this is something that we should really pursue, but the challenge is having enough backing in order to do it. It's a very labor intensive uh, uh, mission there. So from a capital improvement standpoint, this is year of the trail. Um, if you haven't heard, the state designated 23 is year of the tr trail. So we're working on blue ways, which are basically paddle ways like our green ways, some trail enhancements, namely um, uh, directional signage, wayfinding, et cetera. We also want to enhance some signage at the gardens for our uh, self-guided tour, which we created this fiscal year. And uh, if you get an opportunity to check that out, it's, it's really well done. Uh, we continue to pursue gateway signs as well. You saw what we've done on uh, 17 as well as uh, Piney Green Road. We want to replicate that in other areas as well. And then we've also uh, been asked to assist with some of the um, infrastructure for the 40th observance of the Beirut uh, bombing. So there's a lot going on in the year ahead. There's a lot going on right now. Uh, I just really enjoy this as part of my job because it's, it's a very creative outlet. And then it's also an outlet that, that works very well uh, to the strengths of our community and supports e economic development. Not to mention that we've got a great board of directors and they're just very supportive. So, again, visit JacksonvilleNC.com. Take a look, particularly that food trail. There's some off the beaten path places that are just phenomenal. And they have excellent business owners, and they'd love to talk to you about who they are, where they came from, and, and what they're serving. So, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have or any corrections from Mr. Warden if I. <laughs> no, th thank you for doing it in under five minutes, too. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Questions of Anthony. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Anthony. <clears throat> All right, with that, we're going to go to our report section for tonight, and I'll start with Mr. Ward. Just uh, some time ago, uh, the first tee. Uh, decided that they wanted to come to Jacksonville and Onslow County and, and get organized. And they've had a, they've had a, a couple of meetings. Uh, tomorrow, they are meeting with the Onslow County Elementary School PE teachers to get uh, the first buy-in from uh, some teachers and uh, hopefully get this first T uh, program established here in Onslow County and, and provide some opportunities for for folks to, to have, for their kids to have a, another outlet for sports. So that's all I had, sir. Ms. Edwards. Um, recently, uh, Deanna Trouble from the Transportation Department and I got to spend a few days in Statesville, North Carolina at a Main Street conference learning um, policy, strategy, and some really creative solution ideas that we can look at for downtown revitalization since the council has made that a priority you know uh, it's been a priority for a while but it's up front and we've got the streetscape project started we're really excited to bring some of the things that we learned back to our community so we just want to say thank you for the opportunity to attend and we look forward to you know rolling up our sleeves and helping that move along very good dr washington no report sir mayor pro tem better yes mayor council the uh, on Wilson met last week, and after a lengthy fiscal analysis based on future capital improvements that on is facing in a million dollars approach, uh, we initiated a study on system development phase that my understanding is 
once you embark upon a pretty extensive capital improvement program, that changes the basis for your system development phase. And that's what Lon Wasa was working on. And of course, as your representative, Lon Wasa, that triggered my thought as to whether we've recently updated our system development phase or is that something we have coming down the pike in the future? Mayor, I'll tell you, that's that's part of our annual review on the system development fees. So part of our review of the capital projects, you'll see in that draft for 24, we'll show you that analysis of those capital projects. I think I would say it's something that we need to look at every year, especially with the magnitude of the projects that we have. It's just a best practice. And, and Sabrina and Wally can knock that out in a couple minutes. So since they do it so well, you'll see that, Mr. Bittner, as we come up in this process. I figured you were on top of it. Because we're loading up the capital projects. That's why we've got to keep looking at it. Mr. Sosa. Of course. Just happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Wright. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to say, I think Anthony did a fantastic job, and I think his entire presentation would have been an excellent one city moment if he would have just couched it as this is the one city moment because about everything he did there was fantastic. And I encourage him that if he can get Vivica A. Fox back to town, let's bring her back as many times as she wants to show up. Uh, that's just a personal preference. <laughs> um, but today, uh, Mayor was able to, to host an event here earlier, right here in the council chambers, and we were able to capture that, which was awesome. Uh, in this picture here, uh, the mayor was able to recognize Officer Samantha Kinsler for a life-saving moment utilizing a tourniquet. So this is one of our, uh, this is one of our officers who, uh, and with her family here by our side, the mayor could appreciate her. And one of the things the mayor said was, not only was he thankful that she was there, but he can guarantee there's somebody else in our community that was thankful that she was there. And that's the crux of of why we recognize our people for life-saving moments because they make a bigger impact with their daily work than just what we think they do. And this was, this was an awesome way to start it, and I appreciate that from the mayor. Right here, um, the, the mayor is standing there with Lieutenant Potter. She was the project coordinator for National Night Out, and what he's uh, recognizing her with is the National Association of Town Watch National Award for 2022. Our National Night Out event is incredible because it allows us to reach our people with our police officers and with our community members to celebrate um, that integration that we have, to celebrate the activity between our, what was originally started as our uh, police officers and our community for connectivity. The mayor pointed out that uh, many moons ago, when he was in the police department, that's when this started. And now we are 22 years in, and for 14 consecutive years, we've received this award based on the efforts of our police department and the project coordinators year after year. You will recognize, even though you see uh, the mayor and Lieutenant Potter there, that was the important part. Then uh, Lieutenant Porter decided to get in on the picture as well, and then he stayed for the meeting because he wanted to, to be recognized. Uh, Captain James <laughs> also jumped in the picture. He was sitting with me and decided to get up into the picture. And uh, Lieutenant Williams did not want to miss out, uh, as, long, as well as uh, Chief Unero and uh, Deputy Chief Weaver. Uh, Deputy Chief Dorn was also there, but we cut him out of the picture because you can't have everybody in the picture. And so we had enough on the one side. But this is awesome because uh, when National Night Out comes up, we want to encourage our people to stay active with our officers. And you can see by this team right here, uh, we have a great group, and I'm excited to see the event this year. The third thing the mayor was able to do today, which is uh, it's incredible because they're tying so many different people we were able to, uh, to look at our law enforcement torch run for Special Olympics 2022. What's different about this year, the mayor had some of the athletes that helped participate in the torch run this year. He brought those individuals in. Chief Yanero, uh, very excited to create this opportunity. But what's different this year is we were recognized as a top 10 award winner because our police department and the team raised over $30,000 for the Special Olympics this year. Uh, $30,833. So for, for all of those people active, 
that's incredible because that goes back into to an activity and an action within the great state of North Carolina, and that's a value add. These athletes, uh, they explained to the mayor that some were runners, some were, were helpers, and some um, one individual was there to hand out water. And if any of you have ever done an athletic activity, like myself, I walked around the corner today and needed a glass of water, there's a value there. So uh, for, for Chief Yanero and for the mayor, great job making this happen because there's a value add in the community. And just like Anthony said, we're diverse and we appreciate our people. And, and there you go. Um, uh, Chief's team was able to provide T-shirts to these individuals. The best part about these T-shirts our badge is on the back now because we're a top 10 uh, giver for Special Olympics this year. So great opportunity and great picture um, right in here. There's one other thing that, that I, there we go, I found it. So this month, March, is uh, Women's History Month. And so uh, what you don't want to miss out on is the opportunity to say thanks to our leaders here in our local government. Miss um, Edwards, Dr. Washington, we're grateful for your leadership in our community. There's a lot of value for what you do, and we appreciate that. And there's value for us as staff members as part of this team. And you'll see between Rose and Sabrina and Alexis and Pam, we're all thankful for these leaders within our team. And, and there's a value there because... We are diverse because we, we learn from the people each and every day that we work with and that we work for in this community ways to be better in how we serve our 72,000 plus or minus citizens. And, and so I think for, uh, for a fun time here to be able to recognize, uh, recognize our leadership and to recognize our team, thank you to all of you for being awesome and for being so good to work with. Thank you, ma'am. Carter. All right, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Thank you. Aye.